we will start the proceedings of this session by introducing our worthy and honorable chairperson professor dr mohammad ashraf khan and our honorable co-chairperson professor dr farhan tayyab so kindly come to the stage and please take your seat so uh, my talk will be uh, of, in three parts first i will introduce the topic and explain the magnitude of the problem then i'll i'll talk about risk factors and their remedies and then in the end i will uh, talk about uh, how to do this uh, primary and primordial uh, prevention at national level uh, cardiovascular disease is the most common and important cause of death worldwide in 2013 that that's the data where we have a that's the time when we have a complete data there are about 17.3 million deaths from cardiovascular disease and between 1990 and 2013 deaths from cardiovascular disease increased from 26% to 32% all deaths globally and overall in our region uh, that is south asian region about 27% of deaths are caused by the cardiovascular disease and as far as pakistan is concerned there are one in five adults in urban areas of pakistan who have ischemic heart disease that's a ischemic heart disease burden now the problem in our country is that those who have heart disease only 25% of of them are aware of the disease and are seeking medical advice another important thing is that somehow because of the risk factors and our uh, unhealthy lifestyle the symptoms of the disease they appear about 10 years earlier than than in the western world and in our region 52% of cardiovascular deaths occur among persons who are younger than 70 years of age and although the risk factor burden was less in our part of the world but once the disease occurs the mortality is very high that means we have very poor treatment uh, arrangements i mean this slide shows the the incidence of ischemic heart disease in united states and there was 115% increase in the incidence starting from 900 to 1900 to 1950 and then what happened they they learned from that they conducted research and then look how the incidence has dropped from since 1950 60s down to about the 1900 level in 2005 so the marked decline in ischemic heart disease in us and the western world how did it happen basically it was research which led to identification of the risk factors better understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease early and accurate diagnosis and then effective therapy since 1987 the rates of hospitalization are declining the mortality is going down and this is all happened because of uh, improved medical therapies um this slide shows how the medical treatment has evolved and the mortality from ischemic heart disease has declined now the, this was the cornicke unit 1961 this was 95 first open heart and here we have 96 first bypass surgery then we have uh, superiority of primary pci demonstrated so the, the graph has been going down so how did it happen we uh, in america they conducted a research they recruited all people in the town of uh, framingham which is now known as a famous framingham heart study they have been studying the population from birth till death and these were the risk factor which are found to be related with the uh, coronary artery disease uh, we can divide them into two types that is uh, reversible and irreversible reversible are those which we can uh, have some control that is the cholesterol the raised level of low density lipoproteins and decrease hdl smoking hypertension diabetes physical inactivity ab abdominal obesity and then there are you know the factors about uh, which we cannot control they include the advancing age male gender positive family history that means you know genetics and some type a personality stress and diabetes now let me give you some you know some uh, local figures about pakistan uh the problem with these that 45% of adult population never get their blood pressure checked 78% of the adult population never get their blood glucose level checked 90% of the adult population never get their lipid levels checked so that is the state of affairs and only 50% of those who have high blood pressure are taking their medications regularly now as for diabetes is concerned 
just 10 percent have their diabetes uh, diabetes well under control and 60 percent of adult pakistani population fall in the category either they are physically inactive or do very light physical activity and about 46 percent of our population is overweight and most of them are actually females and 30 to 35 percent of adult population they they use tobacco in different forms and in some you know, groups, the use of tobacco is about 75%. And the average age, age of starting smoking is about 21 years. Now I come to the part two of my talk. We'll talk about risk factors and how to control them. Uh, start with hypertension. Uh, we know that about 62% of the strokes and 49% of the coronary artery disease are attributable to suboptimal blood pressure. Now, the problem in our part of the world is that in the in South Asia, the blood pressure has increased over the past decades by 0.8 millimeter in men and by one millimeter mercury per decade in women. This is opposite to the Western world where the blood pressure has been falling. So this is a very important risk factor. The problem with hypertension is that most of the people they remain undiagnosed. And those who are diagnosed, half of them do not have their blood pressure well under control. And these control of hypertension is especially poor in the elderly. Now, if a person gets hypertension, this is about a white, you know, a male 35 years old. And if he gets hypertension, say about 35 of age, he will lose about 16 years of life. If he has, he has blood pressure of 150 by 80. If he has 130, 90, that's we normally take as the normal, the open normal, still he will lose about four years of life. Now the... There are, you know, more uh, how to control blood pressure. There are, you know, non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatments. So a couple of slides about how to control blood pressure by non-pharmacological means. That, is, that includes um, weight reduction, healthy diet, reduce intake of dietary sodium. The optimal goal is about 1,500 milligrams. As we know, they were, the, the fir, uh, first speaker, the, uh, uh, Dr. Shkiel Mirza, he mentioned about that. And then we need to uh, enhance intake of dietary potassium. Then uh, we need to do aerobic and dynamic, you know, uh, aerobic physical activity. Then we need to reduce alcohol consumption where it is there, you know. So these are the non-pharmacological approaches to treat hypertension. As far as uh, uh, hypertension control is concerned, it is the magnitude of blood pressure reduction that determines risk more than the drug choice. So it is not the drug which is important, it is the degree of reduction of blood pressure which is important. And it's important to understand even small degrees of decrease in blood pressure, they matter a lot. There's certain large benefits. <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, the drug which include for treatment of hypertension are AC inhibitors, RBRBs, you know, you know better than myself. Next is uh, smoking. Uh, ischemic heart disease causes about 35% to 40% of all smoking related deaths. There are about 1 billion smokers worldwide. By many accounts, this is the single most preventable cause of death in the world. And it's very, again, important to understand that most of the tobacco use is now occurring in the low and middle income countries. That is where Pakistan belongs to. And all kinds of smoke that includes BDs, hookah, smokeless tobacco are all linked to this increased risk. And secondhand smoke is another well-established cause of, cause of coronary heart. That secondhand smoke is that if you are sitting next to a smoker, you are not you know, smoking yourself, but you are inhaling the smoke. And on average, a smoker loses about 10 years of life. Now, if you stop smoking, the benefits are immense. And those who quit smoking, <clears throat> the, the, the risk is down about 50% in two years. And in, in about three to five years, the risk becomes equal to that of, all, that of about non-smokers. And even elderly, those who you know, they, they come, some patients come, to, look, I've been a doctor, I've been smoking for 50 years. Why should I stop now? Even the elderly benefit uh, from cessation of smoking, it's never too late. And once again, I say that cessation of smoking remains the single most important intervention in preventive cardiology. These are the different, you know, uh, replacement therapy that are available. Now, <clears throat> how do we, you know, control tobacco? 
they, they have to be implement, uh, they have to be effective mass media campaigns to educate people. Then government should be providing support and advice to population. Then there has to be increase in taxes and prices on tobacco products. And uh, then the government has to enact and enforce comprehensive bans on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorships. And then we have to eliminate secondhand tobacco in all indoor workplaces and public places and public transport. Now, this was an ad which appeared in 26th of, on 26th of June in the, news, uh, in the news newspaper, the first page. Uh, the ad said that there are about 1,200 children who take up smoking each single day in Pakistan. And then look at the amount of increase in the taxes on the food stuff. The taxing going up and on the smoking, there has been no increase. I was just talking to Snaula Sahab and he just informed me there has been no increase in the tax even this year. And tobacco taxation reduces its consumption. That And presently we have a revenue loss of about 66, 15 billion rupees. Now next comes the cholesterol. Uh, high cholesterol causes about 56% of ischemic heart disease in the world. Low density cholesterol is central to the plaque genesis, progression, and instability. There is no doubt about that. And reducing the cholesterol may even eliminate the ischemic heart disease. There is no longer in the uh, that reduction of sorry reduction of LDL cholesterol levels has a role in the prevention of and treatment of coronary artery disease. There have been large number of trials on the primary prevention, and they have all shown that the, the, the reduction of lipids leads to benefit. And the question is, how should early B treatment started? It is now recommended that we should be screening the children and all of them who have high lipid levels uh, should be treated with statins. And what is the level of target of LDL? I'll just give you an example in the in the Arctic Eskimos. That is a place in the world where it, there is no ischemic heart disease. And the level in, in, in Arctic Eskimos of LDL level is about 50 to 70 milligrams. So that should be the target. We achieve that level in our population, we can, you know, eliminate coronary artery disease. So sooner the better. The there have been a lot of talk about, you know, side effects of statin. And, uh, and this is a very scientific statement that benefits of statin therapy on myocardial infarction, stroke, revascularization procedures, and cardiovascular death outweigh the risk even for those who are at the lower end of the absolute risk spectrum. Now, diabetes, uh, it has already been mentioned by Professor Shkiel Mirza in his talk. The incidence has increased worldwide. And the problem with diabetes is that 50% of the diabetics, they remain undiagnosed. And 80% of the diabetics, they live in the low and middle income countries. That is Pakistan. And 90% of the type 2 diabetes cases relate to obesity. So obesity co coexists with the diabetes. And it is now you know, said, being said that Asian population may have a higher risk for developing diabetes even at a lower BMI due to visceral obesity. That is, you know, kind of specific to our region. Now, the day you are diagnosed with diabetes, you, you should consider that you have gone older by 15 years. That if you are diagnosed a diabetic at the age of 50, then that means you are 65 years of age. That is your biological age. And those who are diagnosed with diabetes, they have a two to eight times increased rate of future cardiovascular events. And 75% of all deaths are in diabetes are because of coronary artery disease. And the risk of cardiovascular disease starts to increase long before the onset of clinical diabetes. That means there's a prolonged period of hyperglycemia where when they are not actually diagnosed, the risk starts with hyperglycemia. Now, how do we treat diabetes? It's very you know, simple diet, exercise, then oral tablets, then insulin. And then you know a couple of these new drugs. They have been uh, related with the uh, uh, decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease. Ultimately, aim is to achieve an HbA1c level less than seven. And poor control of diabetes in our country is a major challenge for us. Now, th this is a study that if diabetics they control their weight, 
their uh, smoking status, their blood pressure and diabetes, there can be reduction in the incidence of uh, coronary artery disease. So if you achieve good control and have a healthy lifestyle, diabetes can avoid ischemic heart disease. Now, obesity, as of 2016, that's a, that we have figures, complete figures. 13% of adults globally were obese, with rates as high as 40% in many countries. And the prevalence of obesity is increasing. And more than two-thirds, sorry, more than two-thirds of deaths related to high BMI were due to cardiovascular disease. Now, currently, you know, we have some drugs being recommended for the control of obesity. Obesity, again, you know, is, is a common child childhood problem also. And obesity in childhood is associated with cardiovascular disease in the adults. So as parents, we need to control childhood obesity. And, you know, cardiovascular risk in adults who is reduced if obesity is treated or prevented in childhood. Now, physical inactivity. Now, what has happened? There, there has been urbanization and in, industrialization. There, there has been a shift from physically demand, like plowing in the field by, you know, the farmer himself, but now he's got tractors and moving from, from uh, you know, uh, sedentary office jobs. So there has been a switch to less physical inactivity, which is an independent risk factor. Now, if we increase, uh, if we do about, you know, 150 minutes of exercise per week, we can reduce the incidence of a coronary artery disease. You know, just let me just run through. She's telling me we are short of time. So there are a couple of non, uh, few non, uh, non conventional risk, risk, uh, risk factors, non conventional, because there are about fifty percent of patients in whom we do not understand why the ischemic heart disease has happened. Now the the new thing about aspirin is that we used to recommend aspirin for primary prevention no more. The risks of aspirin are more than the benefits. So it has to be prescribed only in high risk population. Then uh, diets and supplements, we get, they can improve health. Uh, Mediterranean diet has been linked with the decreased incidence of coronary artery disease. There were a lot, a lot of talk about DASH type diets, but now it's known that because of you know its dairy content, it's not as effective as the Mediterranean diet. This is kind of you know food plate we should have. Healthy oils, water, whole grains, healthy protein, fruits, and vegetables. And this is kind of, you know, uh, the, the chart which shows that how can we prevent ischemic heart disease by uh, food alone. Now, women, uh, we more than 50% of population is uh, women and heart. There have been not great uh, amount of research on women. Overall, one in three women die of cardiovascular disease. And 45% of women more than 20 years of age have some, of, some form of cardiovascular disorder. They have some unique you know, uh, disorder like polycystic ovarian syndrome, premature menopause, uh, and uh, during pregnancy, if they have uh, a pregnancy to hypertension or gestational uh, hyperglycemia, they're all linked to increased risk of coronary heart disease later on. Yes, you know, these are the main seven things which you know, uh, need to do to prevent heart disease. Control blood pressure, have physical activity, Avoid use of aspirin where it is not indicated, control diabetes, healthy diet, and avoid uh, tobacco. Now I come to the last part of my talk, that is uh, how, to, how to do it in our, our part of the world. There have been three types of intervention in the past. One is the one who, uh, who you know, that uh, targets those who have established coronary heart disease. And then second targets the person who are at high risk of because of multiple risk factors. The third strategy is using mass education or policy intervention directed at the entire population. So we need to change our current policies. <clears throat> so the tra traditional approach has been to, you know, treat those who have heart disease, prevent that is secondary prevention, then go for control of risk, risk factors, and those who have high amount of risk factors, uh, give them advice. And there have been different scores which have been used. There's a Framingham score. There have been the other things that we uh, do in uh, take stock of during the calculation of different scores. And then, uh, uh, you know, all these scores, they require a lot of laboratory, you know, CRPs, cultural levels, sugar levels. They have been risk, risk scores which have been developed by WHO for the poor countries, which just you know, take into stock weight, diabetic status, and uh, hypertension, etc. But they have been uh, these uh, 
traditional interventions have been going on, but uh, they have not been the incidents still rising. So what we need to do, we need to shift to mass prevention. That means prevention for all, because most of the current events they occur in low risk people, and trials have shown that benefits of therapies in low risk people like these are trials. And currently, what is recommended is we should you know go for prevention for all. And uh, how can we do it? We have to make policy changes, legislative changes, like you know, salt reduction in processed food for all, reduction in exposure to smoking, alcohol control, fast food. You know, uh, they have got bad kind of you know foods. It requires substantial investment. They there they have to be governmental governmental um, action. Unfortunately, government decisions are you know at times uh, political, and they often meet resistance. And <clears throat> UN Assembly in 2014 acknowledge that there was a slow, insufficient and uneven progress in the mass strategy prevention programs. Now, I'll just tell you how it's difficult to change policies. It was known in 1950 that smoking is linked with lung cancer. And it took about 19 years for the government to pass an act which will, you know, kind of uh, prevent cigarette smoking, cigarette act. This is a very low amount of health spending in our part of the region. Now the mass strategy. What does it include? It includes, uh, you know, ischemic heart disease, uh, prevention of ischemic heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer as well. There has to be mass media campaigns on radio, TV, on uh, print and social media, and use of mobile technology. Uh, as far as mobile technology is concerned, there are no counterproductive stakeholders, and app-based primary prevention strategy carries virtually no cost. There has been some success in these because everybody carries a mobile. Everybody has, you know, a lot of these apps. They can download those health apps. They can count their exercise, their steps, their, you know, time spent in the, you know, in the, in the gyms. And people, this, people can get messages from the government on mobile. So mobile is the key thing to prevention of coronary artery disease. Now, what is FIC doing about primary prevention? As we know, Panawa was established at FIC and it has done great work since last 30, 40 years. We have a preventive cardiology department. We have a research and development department. We have been conducting surveys and research papers and FSC has been different, uh, has been delivering educational lectures in different universities, cantonments, colleges. There have been a lot of publications. And finally, we are trying to establish a national center of excellence in prevention, cardiovascular research and development. And it is going to conduct community-based research. We, we, uh, there's a lot of, you know, lack of data in policy making. We are going to provide that data, which will help in making government uh, the policies. And we are going to have uh, linkages. We have made linkages with all the provinces and all the major government institutions in, in, and the uh, private institutions. And we, you know, hope that it will act a think tank on prevention of cardiovascular disease through collaborative research to facilitate health and to facilitate health possibly. That means we do research, we draw conclusions, we make recommendations, and then that the Ministry of Health will make policy and ultimately the primary prevention will be you know, implemented. We further plan to you know, establish a facility where outcomes of research can be translated into tangible services and products and impart skills and develop expertise through requisite resource provision and training and capacity building. This is, you know, you know, AFAC, and that's the area where NEPGAR is going to be. This is a PEMS, and that's the Office of Ophthalmology. This is the future building that we're going to have. So what's the take home message today? If we want to prevent ischemic heart disease, most important is healthy lifestyle, primordial prevention. Primordial means that we prevent the risk factors to happen. Like we prevent diabetes, we prevent hypertension. We start prevention from the birth of the baby. And this healthy lifestyle should continue throughout the life. We should have a risk estimation for all who are more than 40 to 5 years of age. We should promote healthy diet and ideal body weight. We should encourage physical activity. And for diabetics, these lifestyle changes are critical. We should avoid tobacco, aspirin for high risk only, and statins are the first line treatment in those who have those who need primary prevention and those who have higher high risk. And we should, you know, forcefully employ non pharmacological intervention for hypertension. And ultimately, it has to be a team-based uh, care approach. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you so much, sir Farhan, for such an informative and enlightening talk. Now, moving on to our next discussion, we have Honorable Dr. Nicholas Pentazopoulos. He is consultant cardiologist at West Middlesex University Hospital, Chelsea, and West Ministry NHS Foundation Trust. He'll be connected to us virtually, and Dr. Nicholas will be discussing about cardiovascular fitness and heart diseases. Uh, the talk is about cardiovascular fitness and heart disease. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Nick Pantazopoulos. I'm a cardiologist in London at the West Middlesex Hospital. Um, I'll try not to go over time if possible, but uh, 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 please forgive me if I do a little, and um, I will try to give you a, a British perspective. I'm actually um, uh, very uh, interested to hear from, from the previous speakers that the uh, problems that we have in our part of the world are very similar to the problems that... Uh, you have in yours. Um, so let me first tell you a couple of things about myself uh, because uh, I'm from overseas, so you don't know me. So I trained in Australia, in Greece and in the US. Uh, I've been a cardiologist in London for 15 years. Uh, I specialize in cardiovascular imaging. Um, I've got quite an extensive teaching experience. Um, and I also um, uh, am a member of the Football Association and um, uh, fitness train uh, professional uh, football players. Uh, I run uh, international um, educational programs in Asia and in Africa. So this is me teaching in uh, Wuhan, China, uh, in the days before we had uh, COVID. Um, uh, my disclosures. Um, now, I, I do have as a pet hobby uh, history of medicine. So despite that, uh, the fact that we're talking about cardiovascular fitness, I'll tell you very quickly uh, a couple of things about the history of heart disease that you may think are fascinating. Um, so Egyptian mummies were found to have atherosclerosis. So the pharaohs had been known to die of heart disease. Obviously, the pharaohs had a very soft lifestyle. They had um, uh, everything done for them. So as a result, they were plagued by the same problems of poor lifestyle that we have today. Um, now, it's difficult to know when exactly humans became aware of heart disease, uh, but angina was described in 1768. Osla realized that it was a syndrome rather than a disease. And in 1912, James Herrick uh, in the U.S., uh, concluded that it's the narrowing of the coronary arteries that caused angina, and he invented the term heart attack. And here's Dr. Herrick here. Um, now, in the 20s, we started to experiment with catheterization, and uh, slowly, slowly, we gained more techniques until Mason Stones, who was a pediatric cardiologist at Cleveland Clinic, perfected the technique. And here he is performing his catheterization. So when did we start watching our diet? So as, as the previous speaker mentioned, in 1948, uh, we initiated the Framingham Heart Study uh, to understand heart disease. In 1949, uh, the term arteriosclerosis, which is, which is atherosclerosis, was added to the International Classification of Diseases. And this resulted in a sharp increase in reported deaths from heart disease, of course, that was statistical simply because it was being measured rather than real. In 1950, we noted that high levels of LDL and low levels of HDL could cause atherosclerosis. And also in the 1950s, we discovered that heart disease was lower in the Mediterranean and the Japanese populations who had, of course, low fat diets. So this is how the low fat diet was born. So. Um, this is a little game that I like to use. What are the three first words that you see? So if you read along the lines, you see some people may read love in the top line, or you may see youth in the third line. But if you go further down to the fifth line, you see that the last word is health. So I always put this uh, when I teach uh, when I teach my students, and I see how many of them see health as the first word. Uh, unfortunately, it's not all that many people, which is rather disappointing. So what causes heart disease? Well, we've mentioned that. It's a sedentary lifestyle, uh, genetics, of course, smoking, uh, and old age, amongst other risk factors. So do we care about ourselves? 
Well, the British Heart Foundation in 2017 said that we don't. Around 20 million adults in the UK are inactive, and that's 39% of UK adults. This is not just people who reduce, uh, who have uh, inadequate levels of exercise. These are people who do not exercise. Um, overall, women are 36% more likely to be classified as physically inactive than men and 60% of adults are unaware of the government's physical activity guidelines. So as a result, we've got a bit of an obesity epidemic in this country. Um, so 30% of children aged 2 to 15 are overweight or obese. I personally think it's tragic. Out of 100 four or five-year-olds in England, 13% are overweight and 10%, 13 are overweight and 10 are obese. Out of 10 to 11 year olds in England, out of every 100 of them, 14 are overweight and 20 are obese. So we're not really doing very well. Um, and as a result, in 2015, 63% of adults in England were overweight or obese. Um, so the rate of obesity is going up rapidly, unfortunately. Uh, so it's not very good news. And Speaking of Pakistan, and I believe the previous speaker mentioned it uh, very, very eloquently, uh, unfortunately, the problem is also prevalent. Um, so in 2014, uh, global disease estimates showed that Pakistan stood at number eight among the top 10 countries hosting half the obese individuals in the world. 25% uh, of adults were overweight or obese. Uh, and again, in women, it's the prevalence in higher in the 34 to 35 to 44 year age group and for men a little older in the 45 to 54 year age uh, year old age group and residents of urban areas are more likely to be overweight than those of rural areas so unfortunately both our countries have the same problem and that is that people do not exercise enough and they have uh, increased weight with the problems that this brings now, are there health implications, though, for physical inactivity? Yes. Uh, the World Health Organization ranks physical inactivity among the top 10 causes of death worldwide. We call this globesity, global obesity. The UK analysis uh, shows that physical inactivity leads to almost one in 10 premature deaths from coronary heart disease and one in six deaths from any cause. So that's not very good. Regular physical activity can reduce the risk of death from coronary heart disease and stroke by almost 35%. That sounds better. So we should all exercise. It can reduce the risk of early death by 30%. Physical inactivity costs the UK healthcare system 1.2 billion pounds, which is about 1.6 US dollars per year. Can you imagine what we could do in the health system if we had one and a half billion dollars a year extra to spare, which we now spend because of the costs of physical inactivity? And the wider impact on the UK economy is one and a half billion pounds per year. So it's a huge cost. So it's not just uh, the lives lost directly from the disease, but it's all the burden that's created from the financial cost of, 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 the, of obesity. And although this is a communicable disease rather than a non-communicable disease, let's not forget COVID-19. Unfortunately, we now live in the age of COVID-19. And unfortunately, people who are consistently inactive uh, or even people who have inadequate physical activity uh, have a higher risk of hospitalization, of admission to an intensive care unit, uh, and of death compared to patients who were consistently meeting physical activity guidelines. So basically, if you're physically inactive, you have a higher chance of dying of COVID. Um, so why does this work? Well, we all know this weight reduction leads to lower blood pressure. It lowers your LDL, raises your HDL, lowers your insulin requirements. Uh, there's even evidence down to the physiological level of the capacity of blood vessels to dilate from regular exercise improving and leading to improved oxygenation of the tissues. Um, and we found that patients who've had a heart attack and participated in a formal exercise program 
had the 20 to 25 percent lower death rate following the heart attack compared to people who did not participate in an exercise program. Um, so the UK government has made similar uh, efforts like the Pakistani government. Um, so one of the ways in which this has been fought here is to, input, to put salt into, uh, put taxes onto salty foods and onto sugary to foods, and we call it the sugar tax. Um, there was even um, a criticism of this on the news about affecting uh, uh, disproportionately uh, the lower and middle income families because they were more likely to buy food from outside rather than cook at home. Um, and as a result, they ha would have to pay more money for their food. And I personally think that that is awful. You know, people should cook at home with healthy foods and healthy ingredients rather than, than be buying all their food from out and eating basically a diet that's based on salt and, and, and sugar. Uh, and the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association in a joint statement have said that the most important way to prevent atherosclerotic heart disease, heart failure and AF is to promote a healthy lifestyle. And they've said that all adults should have a healthy diet, vegetables, fruits, nuts, lean protein and eliminate saturated fats, red meats and processed meats and refined carbohydrates. Um, and there is a guidance on the amount of exercise we should all do in a week. And it has to be at least 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity physical activity or for those of us who can do vigorous intensity activity 75 minutes a week is sufficient which is actually not too much if you consider that you this is cumulative and you can spread it throughout the whole week and just 75 minutes of high intensity exercise can make a lifetime of difference so uh, also non-pharmacological interventions are recommended uh, for all adults with hypertension. So we don't necessarily need to take pills. We can start the improvement by exercising and eating better. So the government took a school uh, initiative to start tackling obesity in a young age. Um, so the initiatives included introduction of the soft drink industry levy, so the sugar tax, taking 20% of sugar out of products, supporting innovation, to help businesses make their products healthier, so money for healthier product development, updating the nutrient profile model so that it would be simpler to, for the people to see what they are eating, healthy options available in the public sector, so when you go to your hospital uh, kitchen, for example, to get your lunch, you have healthier options, um, supporting the cost of healthy food for those who need it the most, so basically benefits to allow people to buy healthier food, which tends to be more expensive than unhealthy food, um, helping all the children to enjoy an hour of physical activity every day, uh, coordination of quality sport programs in schools, a new healthy rating scheme for primary schools. So basically, if your child's school uh, is uh, uh, promoting a healthier lifestyle, it receives a higher rating from the government. So these are some initiatives that have been taken care of uh, here to reduce obesity. Um, and uh, just to close off, uh, the British Medical Journal published a very interesting article, which is called Mammals, uh, which are middle-aged men in Lycra, like the gentleman on the screen here. Um, and this is, of course, a cycling, which uh, uh, has exploded in popularity here. Um, and basically, they have concluded that running and cycling reduces heart disease and death from cardiovascular causes. Um, but cycling, unlike just other forms of sport like jogging, reduces also death from all causes, not just from uh, cardiovascular causes. Running doesn't do so. Uh, it's not entirely clear uh, from the study uh, why there is this subtle difference people think that perhaps there is some metabolic stress from pounding on the, on the footpath as you run, uh, whereas cycling, because of course you don't um, have as much uh, muscular load, 
perhaps reduces this metabolic stress. But certainly, again, it's a proof that exercising um, improves your, your, your life expectancy and your cardiovascular profile. So uh, that's it from me. Just a very short presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, just to conclude, it's been proven in the UK, like in Pakistan, that there is a significant obesity issue. Um, it has been proven that uh, increasing your exercise levels and improving your diet and your healthy lifestyle in general reduces cardiovascular disease and increases life expectancy. And the requirements uh, to improve our life expectancy are not too vigorous. They're common sense things that we all can do. And education plays a significant um, a part in all of this. Um, it is important to start um, educating children from a young age um, and um, make sure that, that they understand from a very young age uh, that a healthy lifestyle uh, will serve them for life. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas, for such an enlightening talk. Now I would request Honorable Professor Dr. Nasir Ahmed Samor. Major General Nasir Ahmed Samor is consultant, interventional cardiologist and physician at AFIC and NIHT. He is also professor of medicine and cardiology at National University of Medical Sciences, Rawalpindi. Dr. Nasir Ahmed Samor is going to discuss about diabetes, ischemic heart diseases and their impact on heart failure. This is a list of certain conditions which can be attributed to diabetes mellitus, which are cardiovascular conditions can be attributed to diabetes mellitus some way or the other. Uh, now coming to the definition of the heart failure, it's a clinical syndrome that results from any structural or functional abnormality of ventricle filling or ejection of blood. Uh, here you can see a normal heart and this is a dilated heart with reduced ejection fraction. And this is a hypertrophied heart with preserved ejection fraction. Heart failure can result because of any abnormality of uh, pericardium, myocardium, endocardium, valvular structures, or coronary arteries. And its cardinal symptoms are shortness of breath, fatigue, and lack of effort tolerance. Heart failure is classified into heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Uh, and in these patients, ejection fraction is equal to or less than 40%. They're also known as a systolic heart failure. The other category is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, where we find ejection fraction of equal to or more than 50%. They're also known as diastolic failure. And uh, as far as prevalence is concerned, both these, both these types are almost equal. And uh, one needs to exclude other causes of symptoms of uh, heart failure in this uh, diastolic failure component. Uh, there is another variety of patients who land in between and uh, their rejection fracture ranges from 41 to 49%. And uh, they are known as borderline or intermediate heart failure. And there's a fourth category, which previously had a reduced ejection fraction, but then with treatment, they improved to uh, have ejection fraction of more than 40%. Now, these stages determine the uh, development and progression of heart failure, which are uh, stage A, B, C, and D. Stage A is just the risk factors. Stage B is structural disease without symptoms. And stage C is structural disease with current or past symptoms, whereas stage D is uh, refractory heart failure. And uh, these uh, stages manifest uh, in the form of uh, NYHF functional class, class, which ranges from class one to four. And uh, as I said, stage A and B are usually asymptomatic. And stage C can have uh, class one to four symptoms, but stage D is always class four symptoms. And the annual mortality of heart failure increases with the progression of the stage of the disease. Now, a little bit about the epidemiology. In 2015, there was, uh, they, they estimated 415 million people with diabetes 
aging 20 to 79 years. And this figure is expected to rise to 642 million by 20, year 2040. There are about 5 million deaths which are attributable to diabetes annually. And the total annual global health expenditure due to diabetes was estimated to be 673 billion US dollars. And the prevalence of diabetes in Pakistan was uh, found to be around 15% uh, and pre-diabetes around 12%. Uh, now, this is uh, province-wise prevalence of diabetes in Pakistan. As you find here, uh, Sindh is the province where it is most prevalent whereas uh, KBK is on the lower side. Now, this is the age-wise prevalence of diabetes in Pakistani population, more than age for 25 years. As you see, this is most prevalent in this uh, decade, which is 65 to 75 years of age, and this is around 22%. Now, a little bit about prevalence of heart diseases. As you know, General Farhan has just discussed about the global burden of uh, ischemic heart disease. And Southeast Asia, which is our region, is, the, is uh, uh, having the uh, quarter of the world population. And there are about 65% uh, of the global burden of diseases found in this region. Epidemiological data on the incidence of, uh, and prevalence of heart failure in Pakistan is quite limited. And uh, they estimated about 2.8 million patients with heart failure in 2006. And uh, there was another small registry from Lahore in which they found the mean age of hospital failure admissions of 54 years, which was 18 years lower than that of the reference US population. This is a Scottish study which they compared different uh, ethnic groups for their health issues. And uh, here you can see uh, they compared the Pakistani men and women with uh, Scottish men and women and Pakistani men and women had, they were found to have 35%, 58% higher prevalence of heart failure respectively. Uh, regarding uh, the relationship of uh, diabetes and heart failure as well as, as far as the epidemiology is concerned, uh, there has been a well-established association between diabetes and diabetes and heart failure. And that is mainly because of coronary heart disease and hypertension. Diabetes and heart failure do occur concomitantly and the prevalence of diabetes and heart failure ranges from 10 to 47%, 40, 40%, more than 40% and 9 to 22% in different studies. Uh, as far as type 1 diabetes is concerned, this is also very important as far as the incidence of heart cell failure is concerned. Rather, it has four times increased prevalence of uh, heart failure as compared to the uh, normal population or controls. Worse glycemic control was associated with increased risk of heart failure in grid fashion. Evidence of de decreased cardiovascular events such as non-fatal MI, stroke, cardiovascular death in general, coronary revascularization, and mortality with the in uh, intensive insulin therapy was established. And uh, there is very little data on the effect of intensive glucose control and the risk of incidence of heart failure. As far as type 2 diabetes is concerned, it leads to two times increase incidence of heart failure in, in men and four times increase in incidence of heart failure in women. The risk of heart failure as with diabetes might be even higher in younger adults. Uh, here you can uh, see um, age-wise prevalence of uh, heart failure. And this was a study which was conducted over 72 months. And they found that this was the uh, age group, which was 75 to 85 years, where the incidence of heart failure was maximum. And this was two times, uh, the diabetics had two times more incidence of heart failure as compared to the non-diabetics. And if you uh, focus on this figure here, this is the group which had age less than 45 years. And this group had 11 times more incidence of heart failure in diabetics rather than in non-diabetics. 
this is again age wise um, uh, rise in the heart failure here you can see in younger age group there is 11 times more incidence of uh, heart failure but with the increasing age the incidence of heart failure decreases and it is just 1.2 times in this very elderly group now this is the uh, uh, if effect of uh, uh, control of diabetes and if you see here if with each increase of uh, one 1% 1 increase of hba1c there is 8% increase in the incidence of heart failure but this fact is established only in patients who already had established coronary heart disease and it's not well established with the patients who with uh, with with coronary heart disease patients who did not had established coronary heart disease they were found to have this relationship but the patients who had established coronary heart disease this was not well established uh, here you can see the uh, another slide which shows uh, the effect of control of diabetes with every 1% reduction in HbA1c, there is around 14% decrease in the fatal non-fatal MI and 16% decrease in heart failure. Now, this is uh, this flow chart shows the various uh, factors which are lifestyle factors, predisposing factors, social, economic, and other factors leading to development of uh, risk factors. Uh, risk factors for coronary atherosclerosis, atherogenic dysplasia, insulin resistance, abdominal obesity, general obesity, hypertension, tobacco use, air pollution. These all factors can contribute towards development of LV hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction and systolic dysfunction. And uh, this can lead to premature coronary artery disease leading to, and all can contribute towards premature heart failure leading to heart failure, death, disability, reduced functional capacity, healthcare costs, loss of productivity, and economic burden. And this is perpetuated by suboptimal prevention, detection, and management. Now, as far as uh, the pathophysiology of heart failure in diabetic patients is concerned, this has, uh, this has two, uh, uh, two uh, prongs. Uh, one is the development of coronary artery disease leading to ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And the other is development of diabetic, diabetic uh, cardiomyopathy. And this accounts for about 10 to 15% of the patients. Uh, as far as diabetes and coronary heart, artery disease is concerned, type 2 diabetes patients are two times more likely to develop uh, coronary heart disease as compared to match controls. And uh, in this uh, study, you can see uh, there are two groups of patients based on the risk factors. Uh, group A is two or more risk factors, and the group B is uh, one or less risk factors. And you can see the overall prevalence of coronary disease was 65% in both the groups, but triple vessel disease and uh, diffuse disease was more prevalent with group A, and it was less prevalent with group B. Now, this is uh, the mortality, uh, is a coronary heart disease mortality by age in type 1 diabetics. And you can see the type 1 diabetics had four times more mortality as compared to non diabetics. I have already touched diab diabetic cardiomyopathy. This is defined as presence of diastolic or systolic dysfunction in a patient with diabetes mellitus without other obvious cause for cardiomyopathy, such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, or valvular heart disease. There is going to be left ventricle hypertrophy, which is thought to be caused by insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and it is important characteristic of diabetic heart. Hyperglycemia contributes to activation of local RAS, which is renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system, which leads to overproduction of angiotensin 2 and aldosterone, which induces cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis and ex exacerbates diastolic dysfunction. There is a limited incidence on the prevalence of diabetic cardiomyopathy. In one study, they found it to be around 17%. Now, silent ischemia 
And silent infarction can occur in diabetic patients because of autonomic neuropathy. And uh, now we come to heart failure as a risk factor for diabetes. I mean, it is vice versa. Diabetics can develop heart failure and heart failure patients, heart failure itself can contribute as a risk factor for development of diabetes mellitus. And here uh, are two trials, landmark trials. This is CHAM program and this is emphasis trial. In this trial, it was, sorry. In this trial, they found the incidence of diabetes mellitus in patients who were non-diabetic and heart, had heart failure, it was three times, whereas it was two times in emphasis trial. Now we come to the clinical outcomes. These are the four patient groups in this study, and uh, they are non-diabetics, non pre-diabetics, newly diagnosed diabetics, and previously, previously diagnosed diabetics. And you can see the incidence of cardiovascular death as well as heart failure hospitalization was more prevalent in diabetics and uh, newly diagnosed, previously diagnosed diabetics and newly diagnosed diabetics. Now we come to the management of diabetes in heart failure. According to this meta-analysis, they found there was no significant difference in the risk factor of heart failure between intense glycemic control and standard treatment arms. ADA recommends HbA1c of less than 70% for majority of adults with diabetes and <clears throat> less than 8% for patients with significant comorbidities. Whereas AHA recommends target range of HbA1c from 7 to 8% for most, patient, most patients with heart failure. Here you can see the goal of uh, achievement of HbA1c relaxes with the progression of the stage of heart failure. Uh, better is the stage, a more tighter is the goal which is required. And once there is limited life expectancy stage, uh, D heart failure and stage kidney disease and other comorbidities, there is relaxation of the goal of HbA1c as far as the treatment of uh, diabetes is concerned. Uh, here is a, a system, systematic review which is uh, indicating the importance of metformin. So old is gold and metformin is still very much in. And in this systematic review, they have demonstrated there is about 20% reduction of cardiovascular mortality in patients with diabetes and heart failure. And here, here you can also see there is mortality reduction as well as a reduction in the hospital, hospitalization in metformin group as compared to controls. Now, there are a few tips about the use of metformin. Is the creatinine, if the GFR is more than 60%, no issues. If GFR is between 45 to 60, uh, more uh, renal checks should be done more frequently. If it is between 35 to 45, then only a very low dose can be used and it is contraindicated if the GFR is less than 30 ml. Uh, these are a few other contraindications to the use of metformin in heart failure patients. Uh, this is the second, um, uh, which is relatively recent group of drugs, which is used in the treatment of diabetes mellitus. These are sodium glucose co-transported two SGL2 inhibitors. They demonstrated reduced risk of heart, heart failure hospitalization in patients with diabetes. There is, uh, it is reasonable to consider to use them as a part of preventive strategy in patients with diabetes at high risk for heart failure. Uh, this group uh, reduces the risk of heart failure hospitalization by 35% patients with, with and without heart failure at the baseline. They are also good glucose lowering medication choice in patients with established heart failure and diabetes mellitus. According to origin trial, uh, they examined insulin glargine versus standard care in type 2 diabetic patients with high risk for CVD. And uh, uh, they did not uh, demonstrate any uh, benefit of 
this insulin over the control. Insulin usage in high-risk patients does not lead to adverse cardiovascular outcomes or to increase heart failure. Improving glycemic control with insulin has not been shown to reduce the elevated risk of heart failure that exists in diabetic patients. These are a few other uh, groups of drugs which can be used. I will just skip over. And uh, this is the summary of uh, various trials uh, about the usage of various different groups of uh, anti-diabetic medicines. And uh, you can see uh, this is the group which is SGLP2 inhibitors. And this, is, this shows um, a mortality as well as a reduction in the major adverse cardiovascular events as well as heart failure hospitalization. Now, this is a case scenario, a 68-year-old woman at um, high risk of heart failure with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary heart artery disease, creatinine 1.1, GFR 55 ml. The best option for this patient is metformin, SGLT2 inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor antagonist may increase the risk of cardiovascular events. Second lines are DPP-4 inhibitors, self urea insulin, and... Uh, 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 TZDs should be avoided. This is a second uh, case, 78 years old man with diabetes, recently diagnosed stage C heart failure with reduced ejection fraction caused by non-ischemic cardiomyopathy EF 30%, creatinine 1 milligram and uh, GFR 77 ml. The best option for this patient with diabetes is metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, and uh, second line are sulfonylurea and insulin. And uh, these are the groups to be avoided in these patients. Case three, 59 years old man with diabetes and recently diagnosed stage C, heart failure, EF 60%, uh, creatinine one and GFR 71. Again, the best option are same and second line are same. And uh, this is case four, 72 years old woman with diabetes stage C, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction caused by ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF 35%, creatinine two, and uh, GFR 25. Here, insulin is the best option, and second option are these groups. Coming to the management of heart failure in diabetic patients, these are the as you all know, these are the commonly used groups of drugs for the management of heart failure. They are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ARNI, beta blockers, spironolactone or epilinone, and secondary treatments as indicated, evabradine and hydralazine nitrates and digoxin. Uh, these are the uh, patients in which uh, multiple uh, randomized controls, they compared the different uh, drug groups and you can see uh, the reduction of uh, mortality and hospitalization in these groups and uh, their percentages benefits are shown here. Now, this is a trial we showed the superiority of ARNI, which is angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors over the uh, conventional uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And uh, this is you now well-established treatment of heart failure. Uh, these, this, uh, this is the summary of the treatment of uh, guideline-directed therapy for the stage C and stage D heart failure. Initially, we start with ARBs or ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and uh, diuretics. And if there is persistence of symptoms, we proceed on to addition of aldosterone, uh, conversion from ACE inhibitors and ARBs to ARNI, and uh, we can uh, start... Uh, hydralazine nitrate group in uh, black people, and uh, we can consider implantation of ICD and CRT. And if they are non-responders, these are the options, palliative care, transplant, and LVATs. Now, the take-home message is diabetes increases the risk of heart failure development. Diabetes is relatively more prevalent in heart failure patients. Diabetes increases the risk of mortality and hospitalization in heart failure patients. SGLT2 antagonists provide maximum reduction in mortality in heart failure hospitalization patients with diabetes and heart failure. Metformin is safe and effective in reducing mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. 
Insulin neither increases nor decreases heart failure mortality and hospitalization. Thiazolidine dione's are contraindicated in heart failure patients. The management of heart failure in diabetes is the same as management of heart failure with, without diabetes. Prevention is always better than cure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanasi Samur. Our last presenter for this session is Honorable Professor Dr. Abdul Hamid Siddiqui, Consultant Cardiologist, Physician and Deputy Director Academics at AFIC and IHD. He is also Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at the National University of Medical Sciences, Rawalpindi. Dr. Abdul Hamid Siddiqui will share his thoughts on hypertensive heart disease, its prevention and control. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am uh, grateful to organize this for asking me to give a talk on hypertension. Uh, my talk has already been made easier uh, by Professor Han Tayyip, who already uh, alluded to some uh, aspects, uh, uh, covered some aspects of the hypertension. Hypertension is a silent killer. Uh, it might be disturbing for the audience that if I say that those who are more than 18 years of age, half of, you, half of uh, them might be hypertensive if we take more than 120, 80 as the cutoff line. But never mind, if it is still less than 140, 90, the treatment may not be quiet. So hypertension, as uh, already discussed, is a serious medical condition. And uh, more than 1 billion people all over the world are hypertensive. And unfortunately, two thirds are, uh, out of them are living in uh, low and middle and low income countries, as is our part of the world. Uh, according to 2015 estimates, one in four men and one in five men had hypertension and fewer than uh, one in five people with hypertension have the problem under control. The hypertension has been said a disease of halves, but unfortunately it's a bad half, not the better half. Half of those who are hypertensive, they do not know that they are hypertensive. Those who are hypertensive, only half of them are on medication. And those hypertensive who are taking medication, only half of them are under control. So it's a major cause of premature death worldwide. One of the global uh, targets of NCD disease to reduce the prevalence of hypertension Burden is by is by 25 percent uh, uh, by the years 20, uh, 2025. In 2015, around 15 million died from uh, NCDs, and the major contributor was hypertension in in these deaths. And these all premature deaths were preventable. As I already mentioned, as a single risk factor, it is the leading uh, preventable. Uh, the cost worldwide, but it still counts for more than 10 million deaths every year. It kills more than any other condition and more than all the infectious diseases combined. So just comparing the disease burden uh, from year 2000 to 25,000, it has increased. It has gone to 29% uh, of the world population. There were 9.2 million hypertensive in year 2000, but now it has increased more than one half billion. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the difficult uh, part is that the increase has been in our part of the world, that is in the Asia, Africa, which are uh, developing economies. So hypertension treatment is almost responsible for 10% of all healthcare spending, and it is going to count for almost 370 billion dollars uh, for, uh, for the treatment of hypertension worldwide. So world map showing the uh, prevalence of disease, as I already mentioned, it is mainly in our part of the world. 
and in the African region. So the lowest prevalence rates are in America, but they are highest in Africa and Southeast Asia is not far behind. The prevalence is still very high in our neighboring countries that in the Middle East is almost sitting uh, more than 23% in most of the region, including Pakistan. As far as the burden of disease in Pakistan is concerned, it's still very high. According to one estimate, it was 20, it is around 26.34%. Uh, and it is higher in the urban population as compared to the rural dwellers. So what are the risk factors for the major risk factor that is a hypertension? There are uh, different factors like the social determinants and drivers, the globalization, urbanization, aging, in, uh, income, education, and housing and uh, crowding. Then there are certain behavioral factors that the unhealthy diet, tobacco use, physical inactivity, and other use of uh, alcohol. And there are certain metabolic factors, like as uh, just mentioned by Professor Nasir, the diabetes, hypertension, they, they go side and side. Obesity, lipids, and that's, uh, uh, and the, what is the effect of this, of, of, of all these risk factors? Hypertension alone is responsible for almost 45% of all deaths because of cardiovascular disease, and almost 50% deaths because of strokes are the contributing factor is hypertension. And as you can see here, the risk factor which, uh, which leads to development of hypertension, almost 81% are diet related. That's obesity, high sodium intake, and low dietary potassium. So as far as the definition of hypertension is concerned, as I will mention, anything beyond 120, 80 is considered now hypertension. The American Heart Association is most stringent in these criteria, but anyway, uh, some of the parameters uh, on which we diagnose hypertension are depicted here. Any office uh, blood pressure recording more than systolic uh, 40 and greater than 90 is considered as hypertension. But in certain cases, these, very, uh, these figures might vary. Uh, there might be certain individuals who might be uh, labile hypertension. For these individuals, there is a recommendation to use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home-based blood pressure monitoring. And these, their kind of cut off points are on average in uh, ambulatory patients, uh, it is uh, 130 or 80 or uh, during the daytime, 135. And in home-based, it, uh, it is considered more than 135 systolic and more than 85 as the hypertensive uh, cut off point. Well, this is a type of hypertension. Uh, uh, most of the cases, we do not know the cause. In those cases, we know the cause. It's called secondary hypertension. Then th there might be malignant hypertension, gestational white coat, and there's another entity now recently been added, the mass hypertension. Uh, uh, secondary hypertension uh, could be because of different reasons. We know in primary hypertension, we don't know the cause. And some of the key uh, factors uh, or uh, secondary causes of hypertension are the adrenal gland tumors, the coctation of aorta, obstructive sleep apnea, illicit drug abuse, thyroid diseases, and kidney diseases. There are certain variation in the uh, blood pressure response or uh, uh, in different parts of the world, particularly Southeast Asian. And in the black population, the morning uh, surge is high. Uh, similarly, nighttime hypertension is more common uh, 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 when we compare with the Europeans. Similarly, our, uh, the Southeast Asian, they are more sensitive to the salt. So because of that, they have a higher stroke prevalence, uh, more hemorrhagic, and they have more chances of developing non ischemic heart failure as compared to the Western population. So the benevolent hypertension in Southeast Asian, although uh, the, the drug treatment remains the same, but still it might be difficult as compared to the Western population. Now, certain uh, different criteria based on uh, a different uh, organization, the American Heart Association. I've just depicted here the comparison of the uh, International Society of Hypertension and American Heart Association criteria. The AHA is more stringent. So anything beyond 120-80 is hypertension, although it is labeled as elevated, if it is still between 120 and 129 and, between, and, and more than 80 to 89. 
while uh, in case of uh, uh, international side of hypertension, uh, they have uh, labeled the uh, elevated uh, category as the high normal, but the readings are different. So there's grade one and grade two based upon these criteria. Uh, it is important to uh, record blood pressure in a standardized setting because once you label the individual as hypertensive, then you're sort of signifying that uh, he has to adopt a lifelong uh, 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 measures to uh, to cater for the raised blood pressure. So it has to be recorded in an office setting in a serene and uh, quiet environment. The arm should be supported on the table. The, the cuff should be at the heart level. And only then uh, the recording should be done in a number of different uh, settings. In the initial uh, evaluation, the standing blood pressure should be taken. And in some cases, the unattended blood pressure should also be recorded. So if it is less than 130.85, you, uh, you may, uh, the uh, surveillance may not be required, but if it is between 130 to 159 and 85 to 89, you have to confirm it in different settings in office recording. Uh, if the patient is uh, going to have a blood pressure more than 16000, it has to be confirmed within a few days and treatment may have to be started. Well, there are different variations in the recording of blood pressure in different settings, but uh, uh, it should be done in recommended standardized setting. At the same time, in the initial recording, uh, hypertension mediated organ damage should be, uh, if it is there, should be recorded. Screening should be done for that. Because that accrues uh, more complication as far as the hypertension is concerned. And combining other risk factor almost uh, 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 doubles or quadruples or e even many, uh, increases the risk of complications many times. So in, in, in which cases we require ambulatory or uh, home-based uh, blood, uh, blood pressure monitoring? These are the cases uh, with white coat hypertension or uh, in those with drug resistance, with uh, labile or episodic hypertension. These are some, some of the conditions which should be met before we go for uh, uh, use of ambulatory or home-based blood pressure monitoring. Now, we know that the control of hypertension is extremely important, as I already alluded to, that only half of the, those who are hypertensive, they have good control of blood pressure. And uh, we can see, uh, this is uh, some of the figures, as I already mentioned, that out of uh, hypertensive, only uh, less than 40, only 47 percent are aware of it, and those who are re receiving treatment, only 14 percent are under good control. So, what is the impact of treating hypertension on heart disease and stroke? Even a 10 millimeter reduction in stolic blood pressures. It's going to reduce stroke by 27%, it's going to reduce heart failure by 28%, heart disease 17%, and premature death by 13%. As far as uh, the measurement of different categories of hypertension is concerned, the professor uh, Farhanta already uh, mentioned a few, uh, a few points. I'm just go, going to uh, give a passive reference to these. Uh, in category of uh, elevated or uh, pre-hypertension or uh, uh, cases, we may not require any uh, drugs. Uh, simple education or exercise or healthy lifestyle may be enough to bring it down. Similarly, uh, adapting uh, uh, dietary approaches to uh, stop hypertension, this uh, famous uh, uh, health, healthy diet pyramid is good to decrease the blood pressure in most of the cases. So this is just a slide to summarize in those cases uh, in which the hypertension is uh, well established. Those who have more than uh, blood pressure 160 and 100, they are to be considered for medications, immediate medication. But in those who are in grade one, depending upon the risk factors, drug treatment in low or moderate risk patient without cardiovascular disease or CKD diabetic might be uh, or with, uh, without uh, target or damage might be done over a period of three to six months with lifestyle modification. 
in those countries where the resources are scarce as our still we can wait for three to six months to put them on medication only the lifestyle modification and healthy lifestyle may be enough to uh, monitor them for a certain period of time these are some of the guidelines uh, from american heart to association uh, which basically simplifies uh, the cutoff mark of 14090 beyond uh, beyond 14090 that treatment may have to be started particularly in those cases with uh, associated uh, ckd or diabetes uh, these are the some of the parameters uh, at which level the treatment has to be started so i'll not go into the details of drug therapy this is just uh, one of the uh, algorithm uh, adopted by uh, international uh, 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 hypertension association and also adopted by the european society of cardiology that in those who are less than 55 years of age ACE inhibitors or arb might be the good starting uh, drugs uh, in patients who are non black or caribbean uh, diuretics and calcium channel blockers might be uh, are uh, good as a starting uh, drug for effective therapy uh, the drugs can be combined in different combinations as the uh, in cases of uh, step 2 or stage 1 stage 2 or grade 1 or grade 2 hypertension so some of the targets of uh, uh, blood pressure which has been uh, highlighted by uh, american heart, heart association or gnc8 uh, mostly it is the, it's good to remember the figure of 14090 those who are more than 60 years of age less than 15019 might be enough so the aha or gnc8 is uh, stringent as far as the diagnosis of hypertension is concerned and i think beyond 12080 should be considered for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, for drugs or lifestyle modification. But as far as the targets are concerned, they are a bit lenient uh, for the cut, uh, cut, of, uh, cut of points. Similarly, as far as the NICE guidelines are concerned, almost similar figure, but for diabetes, they have uh, uh, the cut of more for diabetes for, for NICE is 140 80, and with renal disease, it is 13080. Now, these patients can be followed. Uh, at regular intervals, I'll quickly, quick, uh, because of the positive time, I quickly go through these. Uh, those who are well controlled on blood pressure, they might be called for review after uh, every three months and then after every three to six months. But if it is not controlled, they have to be called back quickly. Uh, well, when the hypertension becomes emergent or urgent, I think the emergency physician has to do some work at, at emergency department. I'll not go into the details of this. So some of the complications which we uh, can avoid by treating hypertension are basically, as I already mentioned, the main brunt is uh, on the stroke and uh, 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 coronary heart disease because the hypertension is a contributing factor in almost 50% of all deaths because of cardiovascular disease and almost 45% uh, for cardiovascular disease and almost 50% with cerebrovascular disease or cerebrovascular accident. Well, as far as uh, I think in the initial inaugural session, uh, a lot has been said about the prevention. So I'll quickly go through these slides. We can make 50 by uh, plus 30 as 100. If we can increase the global control of blood pressure from 14% to 50%, or reduce the globally, uh, global dietary sodium intake by 30%. So this can save almost 100 million lives in the next 30 years. Uh, well, there, there are different uh, strategies to uh, prevent hypertension. Basically, it's uh, the uh, different modes of different stages of prevention, the primordial, the primary, the secondary. And these are all important to save lives and to, to reduce the global burden of disease, that is with particular reference to hypertension, we have to act at, at primary level, primary care, uh, care physician level, uh, bringing on small changes in risk factors in, uh, in population, and basically following a mass approach as already highlighted, uh, highlighted in his uh, uh, initial lecture by Professor Fahan. So uh, we have to identify, identify risk factors and then we have to give specific advice pertaining to uh, uh, 
uh, motivation to uh, posture uh, to, to do the positive action against all the identifying factors. Primordial prevention, the uh, high, uh, I mean, uh, identifying or uh, targeting at the before the onset of the risk factors. Secondary prevention. So some of the specific intervention is uh, which have already been highlighted. That is dietary changes, smoking, blood pressure, physical activity, and so on and so forth. So just to highlight what quantitative benefit uh, this lifestyle modification can present. This is a common slide that you commonly see, but you can see that without medication, how much uh, decrease in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure this can bring about. So reducing one kg weight can bring one millimeter systolic and diastolic blood pressure down. Similarly, we have to focus on tertiary prevention. Those who are already hypertensive, we have to... Uh, uh, check them regularly to avoid further complications. And uh, just a few points on the uh, community approach to prevent, uh, for the prevention of primary hypertension. Uh, the community approach to hypertension prevention has a high degree of generalization and cost effectiveness. And uh, as far as the national action pl uh, plan for NCDs in Pakistan is concerned, the program focuses on attention on improving the quality of prevention program within the primary and uh, basic health sites. Uh, it's one of the features is to integrate considered a primary secondary prevention program into health services as part of the comprehensive and sustainable, scientifically valid and resource sensitive program for all the categories of healthcare providers. Surveillance of cardiovascular risk factors is important as part of the NCD surveillance system. So what is the WHO response? It has already been highlighted. I'll just quickly go through the slides. That is the Global Action Branch uh, plan between uh, 2013 and 20. Uh, the basic uh, parameters or pillars of that prevention strategy is surveillance, prevention, and management. And uh, the goal is to reduce preventable and avoidable burden of morbidity, mortality, and disability due to NCDs by means of multi sectoral collaboration and cooperation at uh, national, regional, and global levels. So these are, these are some of the objectives which has uh, already been highlighted. Uh, as far as the uh, hypertension is concerned, the target for uh, uh, 2025 is to reduce the uh, burden of disease by at least 25%. So these are some of the global health initiatives which have been taken uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with WHO. Uh, I'll quickly go through these. These are the global health initiatives. So to summarize, hypertension is a silent invisible killer. Increasing public awareness is a key as is access to early detection. Countries as ours need system and services to place to more, uh, in, uh, needs placed to promote universal health coverage and support healthy lifestyle, eating a balanced diet, reducing salt intake, getting regular exercise and chewing tobacco, access to good quality and in inexpressive medicine is vital to reduce complications. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Siddiqui. Uh, now we will take a quick Q&A session. If we have any questions, uh, our presenters can answer them. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, so very quick question and a comment because I would like this to be recorded because the recommendations that would be formulated at the end of this conference must, if my conjecture is correct, if it is supported by the panel here, must be included in the final recommendations of this conference. One point, the comment that I would like to make, particularly regarding the heart failure, the studies that have been quoted previously from 2006 and 2005 actually show a very small figure of 2.8 million people suffering from heart failure in Pakistan at that time, which may be, the figure may be much higher now, but primarily that figure relates to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It does not account for the intermediate variety and the ejection fraction preserved heart failure. So a very large segment of heart failure patients 
are not included in that figure and that must be made relevant and uh, part of the record and any future projections of heart failure must account for all the three different types of heart failure as per the latest guidelines and uh, proper, proper, proper guideline as to how a person has to be labeled as heart failure needs to be uh, uh, outlined. And in that regard, I just have a question as well. And I would like the panel, all three very eminent cardiologists sitting here to make a comment in, uh, on this. The echocardiogram that is actually the hallmark of um, defining heart failure nowadays in the most of the settings does not really account for the segments who have preserved ejection fraction or maybe borderline ejection fraction and they are not declared as heart failure. Particularly with the background of diabetes mellitus, obesity or diabetes or metabesity. So probably some uh, relevant kind of information needs to be included before the uh, echocardiogram is per performed. And the echocardiogram, if the technical experts can say whether there are certain parameters doing the echocardiograms on a routine basis, which can actually account for this preserved ejection fraction, like systolic ejection time calculation or fractional shortening or whatever the specific parameters are, which should be made part and parcel of the actual report, which comes to the clinician, uh, clinician's desk to define whether the person suffers from heart failure or not. Your comments, please. So your point is very valid. Um, back in 90s, when we used to come across heart failure patients in the cornucan unit, many of them had uh, normal ejection fraction, but they still would be in pulmonary edema. And they would come with chest pain, some EC changes, normal LVEF, and they would have frank pulmonary edema. And we didn't know what has happened. And, uh, but then, you know, slowly, gradually, the evidence started to emerge that they, the problem with these people is the diastolic dysfunction. There's impaired relaxation. And they're, you know, uh, in cats, we used to measure if there is raised LVEDP in presence of normal LV systolic function, then we use label it as uh, diastolic dysfunction. And echo, we have you know very clear markers these days, like we study the E and A waves on Doppler, and we can tell actually uh, what is the you know uh, grade one, grade two, grade three. There are the four grades of diastolic. Dysfunction. I think we are now much wiser. We have now other uh, tissue Dopplers imaging. We can gauge the diastolic dysfunction and that we can very well correlate with the heart failure now. But you true, uh, in past we had no clue uh, about those patients, but no, now ECHO is a very good investigation. If done properly and in a proper manner, recording all these relaxation times and ENA waves and tissue Doppler, we can have very good evidence. So you agree that a minimum standard of care would be that an ECHO cardiogram done on a suspected patient must include all these parameters that Absolutely. you have mentioned. All right. Absolutely. And one more question related to this. Role of pro-BNP and its value in establishing heart failure, particularly in conjunction or alone with uh, the echocardiogram? Pro-BNP is a very good test. It helps us decide about the heart failure is there or not in case of you know, bad access. The problem is cost. It's, it's an expensive test. And if we start doing it like, you know, these troponins, every patient in EFIC emergency under undergoes two or three troponin tests and it costs some money. So we haven't started ProBNP on large scale just because of the cost. It's an expensive test, but definitely it is a very, very useful test. It helps us decide in a lot of patients of bronchial asthma, COPD, in the, uh, that these patients are suffering from heart disease, heart failure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I will request Honorable General Kayani to kindly come to the stage and hand over shields to our Honorable Chairperson, Co-Chairperson and the participants.
Sir Ashraf, kindly if you could hand over the shields to our participants. Sir Nasir. And Sir Siddiqui, can you please come to the stage? I request the chairman uh, to give the shield to Dr. Farah. Thank you very much. Now this uh, concludes our session. I would request our honorable chairperson, Professor Dr. Mohammad Ashraf Khan and co-chairperson, uh, Professor Dr. Farhan Tayyip to share their views about this informative session. First of all, I take this opportunity to be here. I feel very good to be here and to thank the organizers of the conference who have uh, done such a wonderful job and that too in the times of Corona and attracted such a good audience. So I once again congratulate them on their efforts. They have done a wonderful job. And their dedication and devotion is in implementing this program is very commendable. This, you have listened to very good, very stimulating, invigorating, speeches by the experts on the subjects and uh, they have uh, covered the subject very well and I'm sh sure that you must have benefited from their knowledge and you there are some take home messages that I would like to share with you. One of that thing is that we have learned today that cycling is one of the best exercises and uh, it not only uh, reduces the risk of the heart disease, but it reduces the risk of the other diseases, including the, the giants and the cancer and so many other things. So I think you should uh, get together and uh, go cycling together as a groups as students. I think you will do benefit from that. Another thing that I have learned is that LIPCARD, which is going to be established uh, in AFIC, is going to be the game changer. And uh, once it is established, it will do a home research and uh, national research. And we will be able to have the national figures about various diseases. And I hope uh, that it will uh, uh, come into action soon. The MCDs, they are a man-made calamity. And Corona is a God-made, God-given courage. So I think by doing your own homework and caring for your own self, you can get rid of the MCDs, but Corona, you have to take says, social distance you have to wear the mask that is not re required in prevention of the MCDs. So better think, do regular exercise, quit smoking. And it has been noticed that the smoking is getting very, very common in our younger population, especially the students and some of the, it, it used to be very rare in the girls' students, but now, even the girls get to the smoking. And uh, I think you should not 
smoke yourself look after yourself and also try and prevent your family from not getting to smoking and that that will take away home from here is go and help your family that they should quit smoking and don't be passive smokers as well and if you see somebody smoking you can always have this should have the courage to stop him from that activity thank you very much